Hello, and welcome to this, the third video on Thomas Barrett of Manchester. Today, this video is going to look at his collecting and the depictions of his collections within the context of his antiquarian pursuits. If we turn to Barrett's 1794 and 1795 self-portraits, which you can see on screen now, with the title Profert Antiqua in Africam, which translates as He Brings Ancient Things to Light, I think it is indeed possible to understand how Barrett considers himself to bring things to light. Dressed as a respectable man with a neckerchief, he is standing in front of and resting on, quite literally, a pile of antiquarian material. These include, for example, suits of armour, including his right arm and elbow, which rest on a helmet, his left arm and elbow, which rest on a breastplate. You can see also um, beneath the foreground um, further um, armoury, such as uh, uh, gauntlets, and indeed he's actually wearing a gauntlet on his right hand. In addition, you can see in his left hand a scroll, um, some sort of deed or charter, with a seal hanging below it on a ribbon. Further down, you can see the sword with Eduardus inscribed on it, which is going to be discussed in some depth later on, given it demonstrates Barrett's occasionally rather hopeful understanding, interpretation and presentation of his collection. Further down we can also see on a piece of paper um, a family tree with coats of arms depicted on it and to the right of this coat of arms you can see a book with what appears to be coins on it indicating learning. The other notable addition to this portrait is the uh, coat of arms on the top right hand side of the print um, with TB1794 beneath it. This is uh, Barrett's coat of arms which in the next video I'm going to be discussing how he appropriated um, this form of heraldry um, and effectively used it as a way of gaining or attributing to himself uh, a greater sense of importance and status within the community. Now this portrait follows on from other well-established types of uh, portraits depicting antiquaries um, and uh, men with particular interests and specialisms. If you look at the portrait which is now on screen, uh, an engraving by Wenceslas Holler of Sir William Dugdale, who is a notable uh, 17th century antiquary and also a uh, garter king of arms. You can see, for example, much like the Barrett portrait, at the top on the left hand side is um, uh, Dugdale's coat of arms, the cross with a dot to the left, and the right hand side, his uh, family crest. Dugdale himself is presented as a gentleman in front of a bookcase and next to a table which hold various attributes appropriate to his um, profession, namely an antiquary and a herald. A herald is a person who operated in the College of Arms in London, undertaking genealogical research to establish whether or not a person had a right to bear a coat of arms, hence being known as armigerous, or um, to design the coat of arms for them. Now you can see that there are numerous um, scrolls with um, seals uh, dangling from the ribbons um, and the bookcase, as well as other large volumes. These, we can assume, um, are historic documents relative to his undertaking as an antiquary, but they could also conceivably be um, uh, uh, related to his heraldic activities. 
on the table you can see writing instruments. Um, he is pointing with his uh, right hand's index finger to an open scroll indicating his um, profession is related to writing and the large tome um, hanging just on the edge of the table, teetering you could say, um, is Monasticon Anglicanum, his large history um, of English um, ecclesiastical architecture. Similar portraits from the 18th century uh, also include this, which is now on screen. This is a depiction of Benjamin Carter, um, an architect uh, and sculptor and father of uh, John Carter, of notable fame in the uh, later 18th and early 19th centuries as a surveyor of medieval architecture and advocate of the superiority of Gothic architecture as an English style over foreign classical architecture. Much like Barrett's and Dugdale's portraits, where the items in the painting um, give an impression of what the person's occupation and interests were, um, with Barrett and Dugdale being antiquarian, um, and um, based upon collections and amassing of material, Benjamin Carter is clearly um, someone interested in architecture and especially sculpture. Therefore, you can see the visual language employed by Thomas Barrett in the design and execution of his own book plate style self portrait which he um, pasted into a number of his manuscript notebooks, indicate how he was working within the visual language of uh, established 18th and 17th century portraiture. Historical artefacts, as well as historical documents um, and larger fragments from the past, such as buildings, were crucial to the antiquarian method of scholarship. As you can see on screen here, an illustration by Barrett, he shows two fragments, two historic fragments, which he, um, which were clearly of interest to him and informed antiquarian scholarship. The first, titled A, is, he writes, a curious helmet, iron covered with leather, and iron wire wrought over the leather given by me to Mr. Lever, May 17, 1777, who reposited it into his museum, London, its weight eight pounds. B. A Roman pot found at Wilderspool near Warrington, six foot or more in the earth, and depth of itself in sand appeared like clay when first found. As you can see, um, Barrett both gave and received historical antiquarian material, uh, particularly those which were local to him in Manchester. This ultimately informed his interest in um, and writings on local domestic antiquarian history. Barrett, of course, could not personally own all of the material um, that he was interested in, or which he wrote about. And in this um, page from the Manchester scrapbook at Cheatham's, you can see a series of um, depictions of Roman coins, uh, which on the bottom right hand corner, Barrett writes, 17 silver pieces ploughed up in the neighbourhood of Ormskirk, now in the possession of Mr. James Ryland, watchmaker in March 1790. So, although Barrett was not personally in possession of these silver coins, which had been ploughed up in Ormskirk, he nevertheless had got access to and had copied them. This therefore meant that he had access to representations of these coins and was able to understand and also interpret their meaning and significance as well as engage with the uh, methods of depicting um, these uh, emperors, particularly using 
profile portraits. Looking on screen now, you can see another of his manuscripts, uh, which indicates how he engaged with actively um, examples of historic material that he was unable to access, but which was of interest to him. He writes, looking through some old papers one day at Strangeways Hall, the property of Lord Ducey, the following by permission of Mr. Oldham, his lordship's steward, I took the trouble to copy and nearly imitated the signatures of the persons who wrote them. I likewise took impressions from the seals in wax. If we look at the subsequent um, pages from this manuscript, you can see how Barrett has effectively copied out um, the uh, documents that he's referred to here, and uh, admittedly um, in his modern cursive 18th century handwriting, but he has also clearly represented the seals, of which, as he said, he took um, um, copies from, in, um, and also he duplicated the signatures. The following page, for example, represents the royal coat of arms uh, with quite convincing trompe loy effect, whereby the wax seal appears to actually be three-dimensional with um, its shadow. Thereafter, um, he um, copies uh, Bradshaw's signature um, with the heraldic seal being represented uh, to a less great extent um, than the previous uh, seal. The next page shows yet another signature um, from October 1660, which he copied, and the page thereafter represents another three signatures. Barrett, I think, here is showing quite an interesting pretension in that those documents that he does not have access to um, within his own collection, he is, ha he is happy to copy and therefore enter in as duplicates um, of said historical documents to his collection. And also, he is willing and interested to forge, or rather counterfeit, um, historical signatures of quite different hands and styles. This forging, um, or rather reproduction, of historical documents um, becomes quite significant to his subsequent um, artistic, heraldic, uh, and personal activities as this and the remainder of the videos will demonstrate. Luckily, a manuscript inventory of Barrett's collections has survived, and you can see uh, one of the pages from it here on screen now. In particular, items 19, 20, and 21 are particularly noteworthy in that uh, Barrett lists um, as 19, copy of a foundation charter by Henry VI, 20, copy of illuminated charter, entry 21, copy of a pardon, um, uh, and so on and so forth. These are all relative to and represent Barrett's uh, real interest in not only like um, the examples I've just shown you of copying um, the text and um, counterfeiting the uh, signatures of those original documents, but actually recreating these historic documents um, in a far more convincing Trump loy manner for his own personal records. For example, um, a reproduction of a charter with notably interesting, actually really quite convincing three-dimensional um, reproduction of the seal. Uh, another one here with, once again, a really quite accomplished reproduction um, of um, a medieval charter. Take note of the um, calligraphy and also the illumination of the initial letter. Uh, yet another example um, here on screen now, 
uh, notum, um, I think really uh, the folded over flap at the bottom being represented uh, in a three, convincing three-dimensional manner. And finally this, um, which is uh, unlike the other examples, um, produced on vellum and gilded. Um, it's absolutely astounding. Unlike the other examples where there is generally a note stating um, what the charter or document is of um, and from in, and in the possession of whom or which institution, uh, in addition to the date which Barrett copied it, this illuminated page has absolutely no indication this is anything other than a genuine historical fragment. It does, however, tally up with an inventory in Barrett's um, catalogue of possessions um, with respect to it being a copy. And if I zoom in here on both the heraldry um, and the initial letter, you can really see the artistic mastery um, Barrett is displaying. It's really, truly quite astounding. Of the objects that Barrett collected, he was most proud of Edward's sword. It is displayed prominently on his self-portrait bookplate, as I have already mentioned, and it is particularly noticeable how Barrett's arm mirrors the blade's arc. The relic and Barrett, consequently, appear to be linked physically. In what is effectively a commonplace book, Barrett records the sword's shape and incised inscription in detail, before recounting the steps by which he linked it with the scabbard on the tomb of the Black Prince in Canterbury, Canterbury Cathedral. He writes, This induced me to repair to Dart's history of the antiquities of Canterbury, where I found an elegant representation of Edward of Woodstock, commonly called the Black Prince. His monument with the helmet, surcoat, gauntlets and scabbard hanging over it, which to my great surprise I found to be a crooked one and the gauntlet's gilt. My sword, agreeing in shape with the scabbard and gilding of the handle with that of the gilt gauntlets, together with its antique appearance, and remarkable inscription, which evidently was composed before the Saxon character was laid aside in England. The above circumstances induced me strongly to suspect it once belonged to the prince's trophies. Evidence to support this conclusion, including letters between himself and Mr. Beauvoir, master of the King's School in Canterbury, are also transcribed in the volume. Having discovered, for example, uh, from Mr. Beauvoir's detailed description of a Black Prince's monument, the scabbard to be one-eighth of an inch narrower and some inches longer than his sword, Barrett postulates that the scabbard could well have changed shape with age. This, he claims, is a matter always common with old wooden scabbards. His research is detailed and reveals both determination and access to useful contacts, contacts. but the conclusions are, from this example, clearly hopeful and biased, rather than objective and impartial. Indeed, in one of his contributions to the Gentleman's Magazine, Barrett subtly, subtly modifies his assessment of the sword, where he writes that the engraving on the broad, crooked sword is from mine, but some call the Black Princes, but others, with more certainty, have ascribed it to Edward, son of Henry III. There is a great probability of it being the same mentioned in Burns's history of Westmoreland and Cumberland, but now, but how it came into this country, no one at this day knows. Although Barrett acknowledges the apparent debate surrounding his sword's origin and the original owner, he does not entirely dismiss its connection with the Black Prince. We can see from this example that his um, hope, really, was, what it, was that it was um, the Black Prince's sword, um, even though the evidence, frankly, was the contrary. This demonstrates, despite his um, very long and profound engagement with antiquities, collecting them, copying them, 
understanding them, publishing on them. Um, his objectivity was not necessarily always um, as it should have been. Barrett nevertheless rem remains a really important character in both Manchester's and um, 18th century and antiquarian history.